Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. The text for the third Sunday of Easter, which falls on April 23rd, 2023, ooh, 2323, mm -hmm. are Acts chapter 2, 14a through, and then 36 through 41, Psalm 116, 1 through 4, 12 through 19. We continue in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 17 through 23, and then Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 35, the road or way to Emmaus. And we also have to say, if it would be great if we had like, I should have like gotten some, I don't know, confetti or something in balloons or whatever that fell down right now. Woo! Thumbs up. Thumbs, Thumbs up. up. But we, this is our 900th episode podcast Sermon Brainwave. That is just uh, amazing. And we want to just thank everybody out there for continuing to listen over these last years and 900 episodes. And I just have to say that I have not missed one. Not a single one, Caroline. Not a single uh, one. Perfect that attendance. Is, you got a, something for that. Yeah. I should have a gold star. That's absolutely. Or uh, when I was in Sunday school, which I always had perfect attendance because I had to go every Sunday, I got a little pin. That was very exciting. And a letter or some sort of certificate, which was from my dad. Of course, I had but to. Nonetheless. <laughs> which is what, why I had perfect attendance. But what did the pin say? Oh, huh? did what? Did the pin say something? Was there something on the pin? Like I think it was just, a, I, well, I don't know. I think it was something about attendance. I didn't, I, I'm not sure. But nonetheless, gold star for me, gold stars for us, 900 episodes. Thank you very much, everybody, for listening. We're doesn't so sound very cool. Lutheran. What? doesn't sound very Lutheran to give away stars only to the people who attend every class. Well, I just think saying. I would. You know, I think I was a shining example uh, for the rest of the <laughs> church or something. My sister has also got perfect attendance. So anyway. All right. Road Why to can't Amanda. you be more like the Lewis sisters is what they, everybody always said to their Yeah, kids. pretty much. Be yeah. like the PKs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so yes. Well, we're, we're, as we've talked about before, we are grateful to be able to do this uh, work to accompany our listeners in engaging the text each and every week. It's an honor and a, a privilege and a blessing. And true. this week Very we true. get to, yeah. And so this week we get to walk along the road to Emmaus with these disciples. And I, that's where I want to start is I, I love the emphasis in this passage on the talking and the discussing and the talking and the discussing, which are all in imperfect verbs are. And so they're just ongoing, ongoing, ongoing. And that that should be a response to the resurrection <laughs> that that's one, one, I, yeah. One reaction or one response is just talking, talking, talking. What does this mean? Dialogue, conversation, and that it's we don't walk away from Easter having all the answers and and having complete understanding and getting getting it. It's about an ongoing commitment to conversation about what the resurrection means for our lives, for the world, for the, the people we love, uh, people with whom we are in, in, in relationship. And so just that the the space of the talking that narrative space that is given to uh given to that reality i think is beautiful so i raised a question um i i, I seem to be in in questioning mode this easter season as opposed to coming with these great one-liner titles and the question for this is exactly where you are this is probably my favorite episode in scripture um, I just love this scene. And my question is, what discussions arise when confronted with the rumors of the resurrection? So I'm still on that post-resurrection uh, rumors, um, but, but what are the discussions? 
that arise. Um, in this particular narrative, there is um, this encounter where all of a sudden they're, they're reporting the news, but then they do editorial. And it, it's like, you know, like, who are you, dude, that you don't know what happened in the Middle East last weekend? I mean, everybody's carrying it on, on all of the news channels. And then they pause and they say, but we had thought. And, and, and so even as they're reporting what happened, their, their discussions include what they hoped. And uh, I, I, I love the way you led us into that, Caroline, in, in saying, what are the discussions? Because that, that's the question this text arises for me this year. What conversations, what, what will your people talk about walking in Walmart on Wednesday because of what you say on Sunday morning? Yeah, I want people to walk and talk. I'm totally on board with both of you, but I also don't want them to talk so much that they miss the meal, you know, that, 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 that the, the revelation finally happens, not because Jesus has great answers, but because uh, he sits with them at the table, which is when their, their eyes are opened. So that's, um, this is part of the whole story. The, the, um, the idea of the risen Christ being present now in the stranger is obviously really important and, and, and beautiful and requires us to think about, uh, I think, the risk that's involved in, in eating with a stranger, especially when when these two look like they're trying to get out of Jerusalem, <laughs> maybe as quickly as possible, maybe they sense danger there for them as, as followers of Jesus, who knows, but that's, uh, that's part of what's going on in this, in the story too. So I think that, that Easter is, well, when we started Easter with, with Jesus saying to Mary two weeks ago, I don't get too attached, right? Or don't, don't hang on to me. Uh, I've got other stuff to do. Got to be on my way. And that's another translation. That's Eugene Peterson, I think. Um, where is he now then, right? Or how is he discernible now? And here's a passage that helps us imagine that. Nobody less than the risen Christ is present uh, in a stranger. I think that's, obviously we're taking some leaps with what the story says, but that's that's significant. And that requires a lot of imagination in a creative way to think about where do you encounter Christ in these kinds of, of moments and around a table? Yeah, I, 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 yes, I think that. And then also, I think that raises the question for me of, of that moment of recognition. When does that happen? How does that happen? Uh, that, and I think I read somewhere that that there's, you know, Jesus, there's kind of an intervention <laughs> of, of when you recognize that. And I've, I've done some, again, I mentioned, I've been doing a lot of work with the resurrection narratives through the lens of trauma and the inability to recognize. Uh, and yet when, so when is that moment of recognition? And so for Mary, it's, it's hearing her name being called uh, for, for Thomas. It's that, that, you know, wounded Christ who, who finds him and comes to him. And here it's this, you know, breaking of the bread, which is not only, I think that it would be easy to simply go back to the Lord's Supper, which was, you know, not too long ago, but the same thing happened in 916 of the feeding of the 5,000 of the breaking of the bread. And, um, and so it, it just, it brings that abundance and that possibility of around a meal, around a simple meal, right. That you mentioned that here's this meal, but it's so much more. It's, it's this, uh, this moment of provision and it's this moment of miraculous, uh, miraculous feeding. And it's this moment of hospitality and welcoming uh, that, that Jesus hosts this table and is now hosting it again, but hosted it for the world back in nine, chapter nine. And uh, so those connections of recognition and meal sharing and and where is it that we recognize Jesus? I think really have a lot of homiletical promise. I love that, um, particularly uh, in, in, in these are the two areas I like the most about this text. First, as a biblical preacher, um, that uh, Jesus turns them back to the scriptures. And then in this particular moment that you're highlighting, uh, Caroline, um, 
if we if we take that uh, the uh, Last Supper was with an intimate group, the reference that you made to the feeding of the 5,000 is more likely where people are familiar with what it means for Jesus to take bread, to bless it, and then to share it. And in that act, the familiar act that whether they were present for or they'd heard the rumors of is familiar to what we talked a lot about, about uh, the Acts reading last week, where God shows up. This is what God does. And so the scriptures would have talked about the God who fed the Israelites wandering in the wilderness. I mean, so that the familiar is just highlighted. And so where is Jesus most recognizable? Not recognizable in doing something new and incredible, but doing something incredibly familiar. And I think that's where, um, when I think about folks that are um, victims uh, of, of, of um, suffering from dementia, um, those particularly who have been musicians, um, you give them a keyboard and their fingers, their muscle memory just starts to play. They don't know who their children are. They, they can't tell you what they had for breakfast, but they can play those songs. And I, I just saw a video of, of a man who was, I think a hundred and something, and he suffered from dementia and they were celebrating his birthday. And I think his daughter was singing an old hymn and he just started singing it word for word so that the recognition is in the incredible familiar. I like that. Well, should we go on to Acts? Yeah, because I want to hear what, what Matt's got to say, because he said yeah, for this. He, he, he mentioned this last week, so <laughs> been waiting he's with got to finish. He's got to finish what he started last week. I don't remember what happened last week. Pins and needles all week. Can't wait. Something about that repentance turn. Oh, yeah. Um, Repent. <laughs> see, musicians remember when you play something. Right? Preachers, it's like, tell me that sermon about repentance. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So this is uh, this is a continuation of the sermon, uh, the Pentecost sermon, and we get the 14a, it's just introduced at 36, let the entire house of Israel know, this is a, a sermon given entirely to Jews and proselytes in, in Jerusalem, God has made Jesus both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. And so again, there's that whom you crucified, there's uh, part of this is accusation. Part of this is about complicity. This is not a, a. This is not hanging the responsibility of crucifixion on all Jews. This is the way in which Luke and Acts paint Jerusalem as the city that rejects prophets and and needs to kind of be um, shook into a, an understanding of what it's done. And the the outcome is Jesus is the Messiah. So then they when they interrupt him what should we do? Repent and be baptized. And that's, and he also has this lovely line, the promises for you, your children, for all who are far away. I'll let one of you talk about that. That's a beautiful line. But this idea of repent, you know, in 20, in Luke 24, before um, the ascension, Jesus talks about how repentance will be preached to all nations after now his resurrection. And I think part of what is imagined here is that news of the resurrection prompts repentance hearing the message of resurrection prompts repentance. And I also think that Luke and Acts have a very particular, not a particular, I think the way they talk about repentance is, is much more like it was in the broader Greco-Roman world than this, like in Matthew's gospel, for example, that it's this, it's fundamentally a, a change of perspective, a, a new way of seeing everything, just like what happens to Cleopas and his companion around that table uh, in Emmaus. When it says their minds are open, I think that's a repentance. It doesn't say that verbally, but that's what's going on. It's that kind of a of a new thing. So what Peter's telling this crowd is, A, believe that Jesus is the Messiah, but all the more so, follow that to its logical end. I mean, reshuffle everything in your mind and then deal it out in a new way that's all based on that, that key bit of knowledge. And so it's, will there be moral transformation that comes of that? Probably, almost certainly, most of us could use some of that. But it's this idea, I think Rolf one time, 
um, you know, when he was part of the podcast, still is around. He's one of our deans right now. Mm -hmm. People are sometimes wonder. Uh, he wanted to translate that as let your minds be blown <laughs> yeah. right by this, which, um, you know, there's something to that. Uh, and so what does that mean? What does it mean to encounter the power of God and then follow that to its maybe not logical conclusion, but kind of to its fitting conclusion? And the rest of the book of Acts is going to tell you that's going to upend in your entire upend your entire life. It changed the way you think about down. Yeah. yeah, it's going to turn the world upside down. It's going to change how you think about citizenship. It's going to change how you think about who your neighbor is. It's going to change how you spend your money. It's going to change everything. Yeah. And if yeah. that isn't the moral transformation, if we can't expect that, I mean, that, that's, that's, the, that's the Decalogue, right? How we treat one another because of how we treat God, how we think of God. And the outpouring of that is how we treat one another. That's always been what what the presence of God means. And in the absence of God, um, when humanity turns away from God, we turn away from one another. You know, that's the fall. Right. And so it, we, we have to lift up again uh, our belief in the transformal, transforming work of the spirit in our lives, evident because, well, because God can raise Jesus from the dead. And so I can expect moral transformation. I can expect people's lives to be different because they confess Jesus Christ. I, I need that hope. Yeah. And I think too, uh, one of the things that I like about this passage is the, even the question, the uh, brothers, what should we do? Yes. And I'm not sure that's, always the response to the resurrection it's usually like woohoo god did this and and uh, and off we go with our lives but when 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 do we invite that question or when do we say that question together that all right yes god has raised jesus from the dead jesus is christ is risen he's risen indeed hallelujah now what should we do and i think that would be and Jesus yeah. said, never miss a Sunday school class again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or you won't get a gold star. So, but I love that. I That would be a great sermon title and would fit on a marquee, right? What What now should we do? And uh, and then all of the all of the things that both you and you, both of you have talked about in terms of how to reframe repentance and, and, and what does that, what kind of embodiment does that look like then for us i think it'd be great and 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 matt threw out a little bread crumb with verse 39 um and and I, i'm just gonna follow up on that what do we do it says here that we uh they were baptized and that their numbers were increased and sometimes we think simply about you know increasing the attendance in our uh, institutions and um, I, I want to use baptized in a different way. I want to hear baptized in the way that verse 39 calls it out. Um, um, in Galatians, we're going to find out that those who are baptized are, are, are a part of this new community, this, 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 and, and, and what is it also in Corinthians? In the epistles, we, we constantly find out that, that those who are part of this community in Christ that are baptized in Christ are a new community. And so this verse 39 says, for the promise is for you, your children, generations to come, and for all, for everyone. Um, and, and so this is God loving the world. And so what you should do is not grow the size of your institution. It's not get more people wet so that you can count that number, but it's so that the community of baptized becomes the identity that brings all together. I think that's good news. Yeah. And you, and a preacher would probably want to lean into next week or at least tease next week, which will show us what that community looks like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in part three of this mini series on, on Acts chapter two, we'll see people living into a new community of, of teaching and worship and fellowship and, and generosity. Yeah. 
And I, if we touch on the psalm for a minute, yeah. I'll, I'll take us there. I think one now with the direction that our conversation has gone, I am now looking at verse 16 as a way to integrate the psalm or give the preacher language for what we're talking about. You have loosed my bonds. And and thus, what shall I do? I am free. I am, you know, the bonds of death have, the, you know, the uh, we have been unbound, uh, and like Lazarus. And so, uh, and so, what will we do with that unboundness? Uh, and I think that would be a a great connection with, yeah, what with with, with what we've talked about. Should we go to First Peter? Yeah, um, uh, if I can just say this about the psalm um, uh, yeah. in, in the sense of what we were talking about earlier, um, uh, we uh, and my, my linking was with verse two, um, that Jesus always shows up. Um, and that would be verse two, because he inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call on him as long as I live. And you began, Caroline, by talking how this is Jesus showing up, showing up for uh, Thomas, showing up for the women, showing up for the disciples, showing up. Um, and this will lean us into uh, our epistle, showing up for, for all the generations to come. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, so let's, let's turn to, to that. But yeah. I just wanted to tie that to as yep. well. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. This, this epistle reading, I, I, I did have a title for this. It's a title I, I like to use, and it's called Facing a Flawed Legacy. Uh, and in this particular case, it's verse 18, um, that um, there's a feudal inheritance from our ancestors, uh, perishable, uh, that is a silver and gold. But we've been ransomed from that a fruit feudal way with the precious blood of Christ. And that gets us into the wholeness of what the death of Jesus means for a new worldview, for a new way of living, for a new way of, of living that is in response to the presence and the promise of peace of the God capable of raising Jesus from the dead. The result in us is a transformed life. Yeah, and uh, yeah, genuine mutual love, love one another deeply from the heart. That uh, again, what shall we do? That that's you know that's uh, as you as you were talking about joy, this transformed life. That's what uh, been being born anew means. Yeah, I appreciate you pointing out that the the idea there can be a feudal inheritance, futile inheritance. Um, I keep saying feudal. Um, a feudal, feudal inheritance as opposed to this other kind. And the fact that this is also, again, has the context of exile or the mention of exile here, which is back in, in verse one of the Holy Epistle is significant. That, this is, First Peter is not on the list of my favorite biblical writings, uh, but Shively Smith is a New Testament scholar who gets me to hold on to it and not, not quite to let go of it. Uh, and to talk a bit about what exile, that 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 mindset of diaspora or of exile, and I'm the last person who should be talking about that as a lived experience, but but to think about how the church takes on that kind of an identity mm -hmm. with relationship to society at large, however we want to define that. And, and again, that can be done in ways that aren't truly authentic. And I would challenge any congregation not to have those conversations without listening to real displaced persons mm -hmm. um, and to learn from that experience. But to think about how exile can also, in some situations, that mindset can set you free from um, whatever it is, a rut, right? A, a false senses, false sets of values or whatever, and can free up a community to live kind of unashamedly in this in these new values as well that that make them look peculiar and look and look weird. I mean that's um yeah hopefully this makes more sense than I, I feel like I'm making in my own head. But but I, I do think it's a valuable image, this notion of diaspora and exile that we get in James and First Peter for the church in our time, particularly in the West, that's where Christianity is trying to figure out who it is culturally. To, to 
to learn from that imagery? It, it makes me think uh, that, it, particularly as you said, uh, being attentive to those who have actually been exiled, those who have actually uh, been dispersed. What does it mean to be called um, in opposition to the culture? Uh, because that, that's what exile was for, for, for ancient Israel, is that ancient Israel had, you know, they had adopted the ways of their culture to the point where they forgot that they were to be a peculiar people that pointed to the acts of God and the presence of God. And um, what does it mean for us to look at um, the comforts of our culture and forget that using again the, 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 the inheritance of silver and gold is not sufficient to what the creator God has promised and intended. And, and, and it's, it's being countercultural that invites us to truly be Christ-like.